Support for the Ripple Effects podcast comes from our friends at the U.S. Department of State, the sponsor of the National Clearinghouse on Disability and Exchange Project with Mobility International USA. Learn more about the Clearinghouse at miusa.org. Welcome to Ripple Effects, Travelers with Disabilities Abroad, a podcast brought to you by Mobility International USA, where we hear the powerful and vivid stories from people with disabilities going abroad and the positive impact these experiences have on shifting ideas for everyone of what is possible. For our first podcast series, we will hear from people who are blind or low vision as part of our Blind Abroad campaign from our National Clearinghouse and Disability and Exchange Project. We hope the heart of their stories resonates with you, the listeners, to empower more people with disabilities to go abroad. I'm Monica Malhotra, a project coordinator with Mobility International USA and your host for Ripple Effects. I recently had the pleasure of speaking with Serena Olsen, a current Peace Corps volunteer serving in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. She had a dream from when she was very young, but dreams aren't always easily achieved. Through persistence and hard work, Serena achieved those dreams, and Kyrgyzstan is a better place for it. I would like to share some of my conversation that I have with Serena about her experience applying for the Peace Corps, what programs that work in rural communities can do to make these opportunities more inclusive for people with disabilities, and most importantly, how this experience is making a tremendous impact on her as well as in her community. To begin, Serena was anxious to get her assignment, but received some delays. She decided to get creative and start speaking with some of her friends. She was connected with an organization in Kyrgyzstan, Empower Blind People, and that's when the light bulb went off. So in in that process, um, Leveraging my network was also a really important factor in in how I resolved this issue, and that was uh, a a friend uh, and colleague who happens to be the CEO at the Lighthouse for the Blind in San Francisco. Thank you, Brian Bashan, and and he said, "Well, if it you know means anything, I happen to know this very lovely lady in Kyrgyzstan who's building a, a training center." based on this really unique model in the U.S., um, there are training centers in Louisiana, Colorado, and Minnesota based on this particular training uh, model. And he said, I happen to know this very lovely lady in Kyrgyzstan that's building one of these centers, and I think you would work well together. And I said, great, Um, that's Asia. (laughs) Sign me up. Uh, he, He introduced via email, and we had a phone chat, And as soon as I got off the phone with her, the light bulb just went off and I thought, aha, I wonder if Peace Corps has a post in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, And I checked the unofficial wikis and found that they indeed, not only did they have a post in Kyrgyzstan, but they were staging that is collecting to depart um, in April, which she and I had talked about me coming maybe in March. So I just thought, perfect, and I drew up a proposal and presented it to Peace Corps and said, this is what I want to do, This make this my assignment. So I kind of reverse engineered the system a little bit, and I was extremely fortunate to have both uh, Elnora, who's the director at Empower Blind People, and her cohort, Gulnas, who is the program manager, um, very fortunate to have them here on the ground because they were able to actually walk over to the office, the Peace Corps office in Bishkek and knock on the door and say, bring us this volunteer. Um, you know, you can send us any Peace Corps volunteer and we can assign them with technical tasks or whatever. But this this is a living, breathing example of what we're trying to build here. And we want her here as a role model. Um and long story short, that it ended up working out, and I was offered this post as an assignment as a volunteer. So it took a lot of patience and a lot of persistence and a lot of creativity and leveraging of my network, but I was able to finally make it happen. The Peace Corps has had volunteers, including volunteers with disabilities, serve in 140 host countries and currently in 62. 
Sometimes a challenge for any experiential program abroad is finding placement for volunteers with disabilities in these host countries, a place where the ADA doesn't exist and where the locals are not as aware about access and accessibility. I spoke with Serena about this question on how to educate the host countries more in order to provide more opportunities for volunteers with disabilities. It's interesting. Uh, I I can speak based on my knowledge of Peace Corps Kyrgyzstan. Uh, I imagine it's probably very similar worldwide uh, among many Peace Corps posts, and that is uh, a lot of Peace Corps volunteers work with organizations that serve disabled people and that not unusual for a Peace Corps volunteer to be working in in communities with people with disabilities. Now going off the point that Peace Corps volunteers do work in communities with people with disabilities, Serena elaborates on one solution for educating the host countries about placing volunteers with disabilities, which actually starts with placing locals with disabilities in the same projects. Not just having the volunteers support people with disabilities, but having them work side by side with the volunteers. The question of integration, I think, is a completely different step. Uh, I've done a little bit of, I mean, just by virtue of me being here, I've done this work, but I also have done a little active secondary work with other Peace Corps volunteers, talking to them about integration of disabled people in their projects and in their communities. Um, You know, really, there's no one-size-fits-all answer for, for any group of of people with any particular disability. Uh, But I talked to them about expectations and how expectations are often, especially in the developing world, they're often very low. And even in the developed world, when those low expectations are placed on people, people just tend to live up to those low expectations. They internalize them and they believe the things that they're told their entire lives about, you know, the nature of their being with their disability. Uh, and if you expect more, people tend to deliver more. Um, so finding creative ways to integrate dis- disabled people into their projects and programs. Uh, and if they don't know the answer, they definitely, the first thing they should do is, is ask that person, you know, how do we make this accessible? How do we make this participatory for you? And they may not even have an answer to that. And that's okay. But to start the thinking process and start experimenting and being creative with how you approach that. When we speak about the low expectations of the locals with disabilities, it's the power of witnessing the possibilities from people like Serena that can change one's mind. The solution is integrating locals in their projects, but also integrating more U.S. volunteers with disabilities at the same time to drive progress forward. We want to take this time to promote our hashtag Blind or Broad campaign, where our aim is to increase awareness to people who are blind or low vision on the benefits of going abroad. With a big thanks to our sponsors at the U.S. Department of State. You can learn more about the hashtag Blind or Broad campaign by going to our website, miusa.org. And also make sure to follow us on Twitter, at MobilityINTL and hashtag Blind Abroad. We'd love to see your comments and let others read your messages, too. So Serena finally did it and received her assignment in Bishkek to work with Empower Blind People. We spoke about her initial arrival to Kyrgyzstan, and I was anxious to hear about her experience entering into a new disability culture, one very different from the one she is used to. So once I got past uh, pre-service training and had, you know, established myself as a fully functioning, competent adult human with all of the Peace Corps staff, um, of course, I went out into the big wide world of my assignment here in Bishkek and discovered that I still had a lot of advocating to do with locals, of course. And even back home in the United States, you do a lot of interacting with the public and you're constantly in educator mode, even when you don't want to be. And the same is true here. And I got a lot of similar reactions here as I ever did back home, but they're a little more um, exaggerated here. Um, It's a very collective culture. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of what in the, in America, we might perceive to be like micromanaging, but here it's, it's caring and it's concern and it's, you know, you're, you look out for the people around you. Uh, and so I was hypersensitive to how 
people would grab my arm when we were crossing streets. And, you know, if I stood still for two seconds, people wanted to help me, um, you know, telling me when I could cross the street, which happens back home all the time, of course. But the more I started talking to other volunteers, especially female volunteers, I started realizing that they were all kind of being treated the same way as well. This wasn't necessarily a blindness thing. This was, it was just a cultural thing that I needed to get over. So learning how to draw those lines was also very, very important. Um, and as my language, my language skills developed, um, I was able to better articulate and interact with people about, you know, politely declining assistance and, and just going on my merry way. <laughs> Serena was very aware of disability culture in her new society and her place in it. In addition to getting her new environment, she learned Turkic, the Kyrgyz language, and also picked up some Russian. All of these were crucial tools to help her immerse and integrate more into her new community. Utilizing these skills provided momentum for Serena to make the impact that she wanted to in her new community, which was immense. Uh, I feel like I've had a tremendous amount of impact. So I've been here 14 or 15 months now. And in that time, um, I've, I've seen the impact of my presence in a way that's made it extremely rewarding for me. Uh, I think first and foremost, um, just simply living and working in Bishkek uh, and the impact of my presence just being visible in my community uh, is probably one of the most important things that's going to come out of my two years of service as a Peace Corps volunteer. Um, you know, every day that I leave my apartment and I commute the length of the city, literally I live in the south side of town and I work on the north side of town and I use every form of public transportation in between and, um, you know, shopping at the bazaar and just walking around my neighborhood and running errands around Bishkek. Um, a lot of blind people are relatively housebound here. It's not common for a blind person to be so active, especially just out and about by themselves. Like people are still in kind of in a state of disbelief. So just setting that example that it's normal, it's normal to live in an apartment and shop at the bazaar and use public transportation independently um, is a, a really important part of this whole experience that I'm having. And then uh, in addition to that, um, uh, I was able to help plan and implement a project to get one of our students to the U.S. for the summer. She was there um, across June, July, and August for a two-month period. And she uh, worked as a counselor in training at a summer camp for the blind in Northern California at Enchanted Hills, thanks to the Lighthouse for the Blind and Visually Impaired in San Francisco. And uh, she attended the National Convention of the National Federation of the Blind. Uh, and for about a week and a half, just before she came home, she was hanging out in the Bay Area, essentially hanging out with a bunch of my friends. Um, but the the goal that we wanted to achieve with this project was for her to just soak in the day-to-day -day lives of competent, successful, active blind people, because that culture doesn't really exist here. It's just starting to, it's in its nascent form. It's just starting to emerge. And since it doesn't really exist here, we need young, enthusiastic blind people from Kyrgyzstan to go soak in it in the U.S. and bring it back here. And uh, she exclaimed to my counterpart, Gulnaz, just before she came home, you know, like, blind people in Kyrgyzstan are crazy. They just sit at home and do nothing. Everybody here works, you know. And that was, that's the light bulb that we wanted to see, you know, that she doesn't have to sit at home and do nothing because that's what her family or her community expects from her you know, that she can dream big and achieve bigger. Um, and I think we really achieved that goal with, with her. And um, then there was also a, on the Peace Corps front, a new volunteer was invited a year following my entry into the country. Another blind volunteer was uh, invited to serve in the Kyrgyz Republic because I believe because of the precedent that I was able to set. It has to be because of the precedent Serena was able to set. The impact Serena has made by walking confidently in her community and also by providing an opportunity for a student to come to the U.S. 
and experience what it's like to be blind, active, independent, and confident will make an impact that will continue to grow. She has planted a seed among many Kyrgyz people and Peace Corps volunteers to show them what being blind can really be like. Not looking at limitations, rather looking at all of the opportunities. And anecdotally, I hear reports from my fellow volunteers and also from locals. They see our students and and report back to us. Oh, I saw your students cruising around Bishkek, you know, the other day. So, I mean, our, our office is up on kind of the north side of the city, but we send them on travel assignments all over the city, you know, and we had a... Uh, our first training program was funded by the Democracy Commission through the U.S. Embassy. And early in my service, uh, the auditor came to go over the, the project budget and uh, an update on how the expenditures were going. And she remarked that her office was near ours and that she had seen our students early in the training out with our travel instructor and that, you know, they, they were out with the instructor and they were, you know, looking kind of confused and not, you know, moving around very much. And she saw them a little while later and they were out on their own and maybe they weren't moving super gracefully and they were maybe getting a little turned around, but they were on their own. And then, you know, a few months later, she saw them again and they were out, you know, moving quickly and gracefully and having a good time and laughing. And, and she noticed that. And that's, I mean, it's qualitative. Um, but that is, those are the outcomes that we're looking for. And of course, other volunteers, oh, I saw your students and they wear, they wear very large sleep shades so that they get uh, complete training in non-visual technique. And now the Peace Corps volunteers see the students and recognize, I saw your students and I knew why they were wearing those sleep shades. Yeah, I knew what they were doing. This aligns with the mission of Mobility International on how to advance disability rights around the world which is through these international exchanges and to have people with disabilities witness, experience, and share these possibilities and opportunities. I want to thank Serena for her time and sharing her Blind Abroad experience with us and leave you with her ripple effect message. At its simplest, uh, and and I hope there's no copyright infringement here, but just do it. Um, If you even think that you might possibly one day might want to go abroad, to study or to live and work, uh, talk to anyone and everyone that you can about their experience, research where you might want to go, why you might want to go, what you might want to do when you get there, how are you going to get there. Um, Start researching those logistics. There's no excuse. The information is there. The internet is there. There are lots of organizations like Mobility International. Um, Just do the research and make it happen. I wanted to do this from a very young age, and I did do a lot of traveling in my 20s, but it was all kind of short term. And really, my long term goal was I want to go live and work abroad. And if I can do this at 40, you can do it anytime you want. You just have to do it. I'm Monica Malhotra, your host for Ripple Effects Travelers with Disabilities Abroad. Thank you for listening. And make sure to visit us at miusa.org to learn more about Mobility International USA and our mission to advance disability rights and leadership globally.